Welcome to the Gospel Truth Show produced by Cross and Crown Radio. We want to make a lasting difference in your life and in our community. Our mission is to produce biblical, entertaining, and Christ-centered programs for God's people and folks all around the world. Post a comment or question and sit back and enjoy the show. GospelTruthShow.Podbeam.com See, Christianity, it's not something you know is not true. They say, well, you know, believe in religion, Dawkins says, is a belief that you know is not true. Faith is just something you believe, you know, just because it feels good, something like that. No, Christianity is absolutely true. It's certainly true. There is no doubt about it. It's true spiritually, it's true emotionally, and it's true intellectually. We worship God with all of our heart, soul, and mind. We don't toss our brains out when we walk into the church building. The church must be built upon what is true spiritually, and it touches our emotions, and it has to be true rationally because God is a God of truth. The Bible is a word of truth. The Holy Spirit is a spirit of truth. Jesus said that he was and is the truth. So that's what the word is. Jesus is also the great Logos, which is where we get the word logic from. Logos has even a deeper and further and wider meaning than just logic, but it does encase the word logic within it. So we have a logical, rational faith that is deeply spiritual and touches our emotions. If Jesus doesn't touch your emotions, we got to check to see if you still have a pulse because there's nobody like Jesus. Nobody ever spoke like Jesus. Nobody ever lived like Jesus. Nobody ever loved like Jesus. Nobody ever did the miracles that Jesus did. Nobody ever had the proof that Jesus had. The tons and tons of proof that just mounted and mounted and mounted. The colossal proof that Jesus had that he is the truth, the way, and the life. Massive. We'll get in that in just a little bit. Jesus had all these things. And nobody else died on the cross for all of our sins. An eternal, effectual atonement for those who believe. And nobody else died and rose again on the third day. Only Jesus. Muhammad's still in the grave. Buddha's still in the grave. Joseph Smith's still in the grave. And all those folks without Jesus, guess what? They are under the judgment and wrath of God even now. And that's sad. Look at the judgment for false prophets. Wow. You do not want to be a false prophet. So Christianity is true. We understand that it's certain and it's unshakable. That we have faith in the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, the one true and living God. God must exist. It is certain. It is absolutely, positively assured. We know this. The Bible says this. And so the atheist who says, oh no, I don't believe in Christianity. Oh yes, they do believe in God. Romans 1 says that all men believe in God, but they suppress the truth and unrighteousness. So why don't they want to come to, to God? Because of their unrighteous lifestyle. They want to keep living in sin, so we have to call them to repent and come to Christ, to believe in Jesus. And of course, you know, when you have your loved ones, you have to get honest with them. And explain how they've broken God's law. How you broke God's law. And you need a Savior. You need a Savior every single day. And they need a Savior. And they need to come to the Savior in Jesus Christ. So the atheist stands on Christianity as it rails against Christianity. Why? Because it stands on the Christian worldview to live in any type of morality. It stands on the Christian worldview to speak things logically with reason and rationality. Because only Christianity can supply the immutable universals that are needed for logic and reason. I'll get in that in a little bit. So we understand that God is necessary for morality, for logic and induction. And so God must exist. The contrary is impossible. It's certain that the God of the Bible exists, period. Not just because I say it, because the word of God reveals it and the word of God is true. Without the word of God, we could know nothing. Since we do know some things, the word of God must be true. Because knowledge presupposes the God of the Bible. Truth presupposes the God of the Bible and requires the God of the Bible to exist. It's like Van Til said when he talked about the atheist. He said the atheist has to sit on the lap in the sense of a little child sitting in the lap of her father. She must sit on his lap to reach up and slap her father. So the atheist must sit on the lap of God to try to slap him in the face. They can't reach him. They can't truly slap him. But they try with God's logic, God's reason, God's induction, God's morality. They try to do that, but they can't do it because God alone is God. Benjamin Franklin, one of the founders of the country, not a Christian in the orthodox sense. So, you know, who knows what happened with this guy. From his profession, the guy was probably lost. But Benjamin Franklin, one time, held a Bible in his hand and stood before a flock of atheists. 
a bunch of atheists and libertines in France. And he read them a passage without telling them from the minor prophets. And these non-believers, thinking that they were really into poetry and prose, these non-believers, not knowing he was reading from the Bible, said it was the best poetry that they ever heard. They were, they were dazzled and delighted in God's profound word, the Bible. The book that brought George Washington to his knees in the snow of Valley Forge was the Bible. That book brought revival to this country in the first great awakening. We need the Bible. We need to call people back. All the leftists going wild, hog wild. We need to call them back to scripture and show them where true morality come from. Call them to repent and come to the Savior because Jesus is not just Savior. He is that for sure, but he's Savior and Lord. He is a Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. So as King, he has issued some decrees. He has issued some rules and commandments, and we need to call all men to repent and come to Jesus Christ and that's the truth so Jesus said he was the truth and Jesus had massive proof colossal proof Muhammad had zero proof for his his positions Joseph Smith zero proof for his assertions Reverend Moon zero proof they basically said just follow me because I got this book well, how do I know that book's true? Because I say it is. Well, that ain't good enough. Jesus had over 300 predictions about his life written in the Old Testament. Some in the Torah, all in the Tanakh. All the Old Testament written. 300 predictions about his life. They all came true in one man. And we have copies of the Old Testament dated before the birth of Jesus. And they have all these same predictions, these prophecies in them. The truth of Jesus is certain. It's assured. They predicted where Jesus would descend from Isaac and Jacob and David. They said that the Messiah would be Emmanuel, God with us. They said the Messiah would be rejected by his own people in Psalm 69, Isaiah 53. It said that the Messiah would speak in parables, Psalm 78 in Isaiah chapter 6. Messiah would be betrayed, Psalm 41, Zechariah 11. The Messiah's price of money would be used to buy a potter's field that he would be betrayed for. You can see that in Psalm 41, Zechariah 11. The Messiah would be crucified with criminals, Isaiah 53. The Messiah would be given vinegar to drink. Psalm 69, the Messiah hands and feet would be pierced. Psalm 22, when you read Psalm 22 and you see it predicting the crucifixion, it should stun you. It should send you to your knees because that Psalm was written a thousand years before the birth of Christ. It was written centuries, not just a decade, not just two decades, but centuries before the form of execution was even invented called the crucifixion, predicting the Messiah's hands and his feet would be pierced. Wow. It talked about the, them gambling for his clothes. It talked about being surrounded by the Romans. All this predicted a thousand years before it happened. 300 predictions happened. It said that the Messiah would be mocked and ridiculed. It said that the Messiah would have vinegar to drink. That's also in Psalm 69. That the Messiah would be buried with the rich. Isaiah 53 and on and on and on. Over 300 predictions about one guy. And the atheists, all they can scoff about, oh, big deal. Well, if it's not a big deal, how come the 50,000 plus religions in the world, how come their founders did not have hundreds and hundreds of prophecies predicting their coming? Why? Because they're all false. They're all false. Jesus had the predictions because he is the truth and he is the way. One guy said, you know what? The odds on these prophecies coming true by chance are as how many there are electrons in the universe to one. Ten to that many power to one that they would happen by chance. That's mathematically impossible to happen by chance. That's just the predictions of Jesus. One source of many proofs within the Bible that stacks up to the ceiling. It's amazing. So I believe in Christianity because the contrary is absolutely impossible. I believe because of all the proof for the Bible. I believe in it because of the predictions of Jesus Christ that I just talked about. I believe because of the resurrection of Jesus that I also just talked about. The proof for the resurrection is powerful. It's potent. You can see whole videos on just the resurrection of Jesus Christ on Cross and Crown Radio on YouTube. Please go over there even right now and subscribe. Leave a comment. Give us a thumbs up. It really, really helps. There's also a donation button. Cross and Crown Radio on YouTube. That really, really helps us, guys. We really need your help here. We're reaching Muslims, reaching people across the world. Thousands and thousands of views per each video here. Notice what I'm talking about. Think about what I've just said the last 15, 20 minutes. And think about a Muslim over in Saudi Arabia or in Iraq or in, in North Africa hearing this. 
Think about the atheists in Europe hearing these things, brought to them boldly, but with compassion, with patience, and with truth. Notice that, how much effect that would have. And so I believe in Christianity because of the cross. Wow, the cross. Jesus died on the cross for all my sins. Expiation was made. My sins washed away. Boy, do I love Jesus. And most of all, I believe in Christianity because of Jesus. If you took it all, but you left me Jesus, that's all I need. I thank God I have Jesus and, and the whole covenant package. But you know what? Take the whole package, but never take Jesus. That's all I need. He changed my life from a thug, from an ungodly professional baseball player. A guy who thought he had it all completely changed me with an evangelist in a 7-Eleven store in Van Nuys, California. A guy, one of the, what they call the Jesus people movement, no shoes, long hair, told me, what would happen to you if you died tonight? Would you go to hell or heaven? He told me about hell. I came to Jesus that night. And Jesus, wow, is he marvelous. He's so winsome. Jesus, he swept me off my feet. <laughs> when I think about him, <laughs> I, I, I rejoice and I, I, I just get so excited. But I also, the joy brings me to weeping. I weep with great joy because he's so winsome. There's nobody like Jesus. He's worth it all. He's worth every single day. He's worth you repenting of those things you shouldn't be doing. He's worth cleaning out your, your, your computer. He's worth aiming your eyes in the right spot. He's worth you evangelizing and sharing your faith even though you don't feel like it. You feel a little scared or intimidated. He's worth it. People need Jesus. They need to know about Jesus, your Savior, your loving Savior, and He's worth it all. Oh my. Take it all, but don't take Jesus. <laughs> Man, do I love Him. Let me see if I have some time here to cover a little bit in Genesis 3. What time we got here? We got about midnight. Um, well, you know, we're going to try to do that tomorrow night, Lord willing. We will go through uh, Genesis 3 and Philippians, or Ephesians 2 and Titus chapter 3, Lord willing, tomorrow night. I want you to understand this. Another reason Christianity is true. I talked about this briefly earlier. I'm just going to give a very brief exposition because I know this might go over some of our heads and that's okay. I'm going to be brief. Hold on. You can check out my other videos on Cross and Crown Radio where I give a longer exposition on it and get into it more. But here's the deal. God must be the foundation of of all things for your worldview to make sense. Why? Because God alone is immutable and he alone has universal reach and power. Now remember that he's immutable. He has universal reach and power. My brain is mutable. It's not immutable. It always changes. It's in flux and it doesn't have universal reach or power. So my brain cannot be the foundation for universal mutables like the laws of logic, like truth, fixed truth, like uh, mathematical truths like geometrical absolutes like moral absolutes only God can be the foundation of those why because those have universal application and reach and they're immutable the physical cosmos and everything within it is mutable it's always changing it's always in flux it does not have universal reach or scope or power so it cannot be the foundation for these universal mutables that notice this they're utilizing everything we say and everything we think and everything we do. They're inescapable. So everything in the universe is proof and evidence that God exists. It screams God exists, God exists, God exists. There's no way to escape it. And so that's just one other proof for the existence of God. Bonson said it this way. He said, a person who argues that air doesn't exist will all the while breathe air while he is arguing that air doesn't exist. Yet if he said what was true, then he couldn't breathe at all. The theory that air doesn't exist would mean that you wouldn't be breathing. You could say you must be wrong because I'm arguing that air doesn't exist while I'm breathing. In reality, continuing to breathe disproves this theory. And the atheist is just like that because the atheist uses the laws of logic all the while disputing God's existence. And only God can be the foundation and the source and the font 
for the laws of logic. So just like the guy breathing the air who says, oh, I don't believe air exists all the while breathing air. The person who says, I don't believe God exists is all the while using the laws of logic that only God can supply. And so the existence of God is certain. There's no way around it. Uh, in fact, anytime you try to make a way around it, you're using God's laws of logic and his other uh, universal mutables to try to make your case that God, God doesn't exist. So even atheism presupposes theism. Atheism requires God to exist to even mount its case. And of course, in principle, atheism is impossible. And the main reason we know atheism is false is because the Bible tells us so. And because Jesus told us so. We appreciate you guys joining us tonight. We still have about 15 more minutes left of the program. But we, we do need your help. I'm telling you guys and gals out there, if you can help us uh, by giving any amount you can, we're not going to make this long. This will be very, very brief. Give if you can. There's a donation button on our YouTube channel, Crossing Crown Radio. Feel free to give if God puts it on your heart. But I, I'm just asking you, as a friend, as a fellow believer, as someone trying to get this message out there, we really, really need your help. If you can give, I'd really appreciate that. You can also see the link on the description of this uh, particular uh, broadcast on Facebook, or you can go to alccgranberry.com and go to the donation button there. But give if you can, and we'd really appreciate that. This week I talked to a guy from India, and I'm smart enough to know, you know, <laughs> smart enough to know that just because he's from India and he looks like he's from India doesn't mean that he's necessarily Hindu, even though uh, Hindus make up the great majority of India. I'm not going to assume that he is Hindu in case he's Muslim or perhaps he's even a Christian, right? So I'm out there witnessing and I'm talking to him. He's, he's basically just about four blocks from my house um, over here uh, near the Granbury Square. And so we're both just kind of kicking back, you know, and, and, and I got tracks and I'm handing them out. So I hand him a track and I, I ask him, you know, what's he think about God? And he goes, uh, well, you know, I believe in God. And I go, oh, where are you from? He goes, well, I'm from originally from India, but now I live in Dallas with my family. And now his family comes and joins him while I'm talking to him. He, his wife and I think there was two kids. And they're there and they're listening to this conversation. So he says, I, you know, I'm a Christian. And so I'm thinking, okay, I wonder what kind of Christian. So I'm going, oh, have you ever heard of the gospel? He goes, yeah, you know, I believe in the gospel. I go, well, do you know what, he is, what it is? He's, no, oh, I don't really. So I told him what 1 Corinthians 15 says, that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. He was buried and rose again on the third day. That that's the content of the gospel. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. And so I explained those things to him. Then I asked him if he knew what justification was. He said, no, he never heard of it. And he had been going to a Catholic church. And so I said, well, you know what? You might want to go to a Bible-believing church that teaches the gospel and teaches the basics of the faith and also teaches on justification because justification means all your sins are washed away by the blood of Jesus and you're declared righteous, that you have the imputation of Christ's righteousness. He said he never heard of that. That as I explained it to him, you can see his heart starting to lift. And you could see, I don't know if he was saved prior to this conversation or he got saved within the conversation, but I prayed with him. And by the end of it, you could tell that he heard truths that he'd never heard before. And then his heart was rejoicing that his faith was not works righteousness faith. But that now he's going to go do God's works and he's going to obey God's commandments and his word out of gratitude and out of love because he loves the Savior. He's not going to do it to try to make himself holy in his own works, but he's going to understand that God washes away all of his sins. Hey, Cassandra, are you out in Kentucky yet or Indiana? Uh, there's my daughter, Cassandra Boyd. She just moved uh, actually today. So I don't know if she's out there. I'll hear about that in a little bit. Hope her and her dogs and her hubby uh, got there safely. God bless you guys. Good to have you. But so that's what happened with, with that gentleman. So you never know where a conversation is going to go. You hand someone a track and you just start talking to them a little bit. Hello, Sam. And you, and you share a little bit. You say, guys, I just can't do that. I'm just so, you know, shy. I, I just think I, I don't want to get rejected. Don't think that way. Just think about how much you love Jesus and just do it. Don't overthink it. Once you start thinking, you know, your mind's like an idol factory. You start thinking these things and, and you're going to give yourself excuses or reasons not to do it. Just, just do it. Well, that's easy for you to say. You've been evangelizing for years and years. Yeah, but I'm not, I don't have the gift of evangelism. I, I prayed for the gift. I pray for God to always be with me when I go out evangelizing. And he's always there with me. And he promises me the power of the Holy Spirit, especially as I preach his word. I know that. 
But you know what? I don't have the gift of evangelism, uh, but I go forth with evangelism because Jesus said go. He said for all of us to go and preach the gospel to the lost. And this is what we have to do. And the church in large measure is not doing that. And I know most of us are not doing this. This is, again, not a guilt trip. It's just, hey, pray about it. Pray about it and just obey God's word and just do it. Don't give yourself reasons not to. Keep some tracks with you. Keep some church invites with you. Pray about it when you go forth in your job. Think about your coworkers who are lost. Pray for them on your way to work and then invite them to church. Witness to them. And I'll tell you, scratch out at least once a month for a time where you go out in your community and you witness for Jesus. Start with just once a month for an hour to make sure you bring somebody with you and go out there and share the gospel with people, hand out tracts, witness, and do what God would tell you to do. You bet, Lance. I, I appreciate you so much, my brother. I miss you. I miss Las Vegas and all the people out there. Uh, but God bless you so much, my brother. Um, when you consider all the faithful people in the Bible, we see that they all had flaws. They all messed up. But in the end, God was with them and they persevered and they kept the faith because of the cross, because of Jesus, because we really, 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 really have a friend in Jesus. The blessings and the joy of having Jesus as a friend should be enough to motivate you to share your faith. His friendship should be enough to motivate you to follow his word out of love and gratitude. It really, really should. Sometimes as Christians, we need to keep things simple. We want to start getting into all these complicated things and we start then following, falling gently into the flesh without even realizing all of a sudden we have all these excuses for doing this behavior, that behavior, or not to do what Jesus tells us to do. Keep it simple. Keep God's word in your heart. Read his word, memorize his word, and share his word. Very simple but powerful things. And so understanding how much God loves you. See, people will let you down. They always will. You can, if Jed's still on, you can talk to him about it. In his ministry, many, many people let him down. But that guy has been on fire for decades and decades and decades. And if there's one thing you can say for sure is he did not care what man thought. He was going to preach the gospel in season and out of season. Because there's only two seasons for him. And that's in season, out of season. And you must preach the gospel both seasons. Because people will let you down. They always will. Harry can say amen to that. We all can. We can all think of people. We can even get bitter about it. But we shouldn't. We should pray for them. Demas letting Paul down. Near the end of Paul's ministry. Completely let down and abandoned. And forsaken. And abused by this guy. And Paul says at the end after he talks about this guy. He says, I hope that God doesn't lay it to his charge. Stephen. Being stoned to death. Father, forgive them. Basically, they know not what they do. Don't lay it to their charge. Of course, that's what Jesus did on the cross. Jesus is your friend. You always have a friend when everybody else has abandoned you. The Lord Jesus, you can always turn to as Savior, friend, and you Christians and me, Lord, Lord. I'm not Lord. My way is not Lord. Jesus is Lord. When you see in the Bible where people did things that were right in their own eyes, it leads to destruction because the Bible says there's a, there's a way that seems right unto men, but it leads to destruction. Do not do what's right in your own eyes, but trust the Lord with all of your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding, but acknowledge him in most of your, nope, in all of your ways. Acknowledge him in all of your ways. To truly have Jesus as friend is transforming. I have a lot of good friends. And I even have a lot of good friends here on Facebook, Harry and Lance and others that are here tonight. You're my friends. So many of you have supported this ministry. You, you've worked hard and you, you sweat at your job and you give to this ministry. You've prayed for this ministry. You, you, you've talked to me. You've shared with me your heart. You've helped uh, support this ministry with your words and your, and, and your deeds and your actions and your prayers. And I appreciate that so much. But you know, in the end, that Jesus is the one who's never, ever going to leave you nor forsake you. Because no matter what you do, no matter what you face, no matter what comes your way, Jesus is with you. When you get there, you will 
perhaps be troubled because of the things you've gone through and you don't understand it and you look up, how can these things be? But Jesus is even closer to you then than at any other time. Isn't that wonderful? See, when you understand who God is and that he's your friend, that you trust him. <laughs> it softens your heart. It puts you in a place that you never thought you would be. You're so tender, you can't even believe you're the same person. After five years of walking with Jesus, after 10 years, after 20 years, after 30 years or more, you can't even be recognized in a sense of who you are spiritually and emotionally. That Jesus has touched your heart and since he's been your best friend and your Lord and Savior and he's always, always, always been with you like nobody's been with you. When you've had to pull over in your car because Jesus has so touched you that you're weeping and you're weeping and you have to pull over because it's not even safe to drive. When you've seen things happen to you or your family that you could not understand, you could not think that you could possibly carry on, but Jesus has been with you and he sustains you and he supports you and he lifts you up. He's a lifter of your head. You understand why Jesus as your friend is so important. That he can be trusted, that he's always, always there. As you discover more and more about God and who he is, and as his attributes unfold, especially his love and his joy and his faithfulness, as that unfolds into your heart and makes it makes trusting him easier and easier to do, that even in the storms, even when things collapse under your feet, and even in the seasons of sunshine and joy, when you're on top of the mountain, you know Jesus is there with you and you must hang on tightly to him up there at the top or in the valley. You must, you must, you must hold on to Jesus. The aspect of Jesus' nature as your friend carries you to the place of Calvary where Jesus submerged himself in human hatred to die on the cross for you and I. Jesus himself bloodied from the nails and the thorns and the spears. The earthly infernal hatred mauled Jesus on the cross because he loved you that much. The earthly hatred until the sky was beclouded and the sun was darkened and hidden because sin was atoned and the earth quaked and the blood spilled. The outrage of the cosmos, the only sinless person, the Son of God, the Son of Man, was executed on the cross for being good and pure and holy and true. And salvation has come into our souls because of the cross. The might of Rome hammered Jesus to the cross and pierced his hands and his feet as was prophesied in Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53. And Jesus loved you so much. Jesus was covered with blood, mud, and sin. Holiness and flesh absorbing the full-flung judgment of the world of sin, death, and the grave hurled upon Jesus because he cared for you that much. At the cross, the fuming hatred of the world crucified Jesus. The pain, the wrath, the rejection, the hatred, and then buried for three days. Silence. For three days. Now Jesus on that third day. The stone is rolled away. Jesus is quickened back to life. Jesus crucified in Jerusalem. And risen in glory. Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. Thank God Almighty. Your Savior is alive. That's why he can be your best friend. Muhammad is dead, Jim Jones is dead, David Koresh is dead, and they all stay dead. Jesus is alive. And that's why Martin Luther, his last words, he did not have a perfect ministry, nobody does. But he was faithful to the Lord, faithful to the cross. And his last words were a mixture of German and Latin. And this was what Luther said with his last breath, he said, This name, Baltar, Hawk F. Vernon Vesson, which means beggars, this is true. <laughs> wow. Luther got it. Luther's allegiance to the cross 
and to Jesus, his best friend. He clinged to Jesus in his last breath because his last breath on earth was his first breath in heaven with his eyes open to see the field of heaven. And there his Savior was still the scars on his hands and his feet. His Savior he ran to, he sprinted to, and he ran and he fell at his feet. And then after an eon, an eon of worshiping his majesty, he got up and hugged him for a time that seemed to last an eternity. Because Luther was with his Savior, his friend. And one day we're all going to have the same experience. And if you don't know Jesus, this is your opportunity. You've listened to the show, you've heard the gospel, and you need Jesus. You desperately need Jesus. Christian, non-Christian, the good news is that God forgives Christians too through the cross. Christians, you do not need to have any shame or guilt. What you need to recognize what you've done wrong and turn from it and turn to Jesus. And know he's always, always there with open arms. And he forgives you and utterly forgives you. If you don't know Jesus, you come. You come tonight. If you're driving in your car here in this video, you pull over right now. You pull over in a safe place. If you're at home, get alone. Whatever it takes, get alone. And you call out to God. And you call out like that guy did, that sinner, that publican did in Luke 18 where he said he couldn't even look to heaven. But he beat his breast. Hello, Maria. He beat his breast and said to God, God... Be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus, our Savior, the Good Shepherd, the Lord of Lords, the Messiah, the Alpha, the Omega, he said, this man went home justified. If you confess and you believe in your heart, and you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, that he died for you and rose again, you shall be saved. You right now, you confess, Father, I believe. I believe in Jesus. I believe he's the Messiah. I believe he's a son of God who died on the cross for all my sins. I turn from my ways and I fling myself upon Jesus. And I believe that he died on the cross for all my sins. I believe he rose again. I give my heart. I give my life. I will follow him all the days of my life from this day forth. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if that's you, let us know. We'll send you free materials. We'll pay the posters. We don't care. Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist, atheist, agnostic, whatever you once were, now you're Jesus. Now you're one of his. Now you're the Savior's friend. Now Jesus is your Lord and Savior. You let us know. We'll get you those free materials. We give you at least two free books if you want those, if you just got saved. If you can't afford our materials, you also can write us. We'll get you those books. If you can afford to, to help us, in this ministry, get this word out around the world to thousands and thousands of people who need to hear why Christianity is true, why it's impossible for it not to be true, why it is certainly true with all the evidence, with all the, the, the proof that we can mount. If you want to support this ministry and then calling people to faith, calling our culture and our society to turn from their wickedness and their silliness and their looniness and come to Jesus. If you want to support us, Go ahead and text 84321 in your phone. That's 84321 in your smartphone. Give as God would put on your heart. Go to Life Church and give as you would have. You can also, like I said, if you could support us at Cross and Crown Radio, go there on YouTube, Cross and Crown Radio on YouTube and subscribe. That helps a whole bunch. It really does. If you can leave comments, give us likes for the videos, it helps also. And like I said, there is a donation button there. We don't push for money here. We're not going to do that. We just uh, trust God that he will put on his, his children's heart who are supposed to give and who's, who's not. So any questions, feel free to message us on Facebook. Thanks for joining us at Life Church today. It's our joy to play a role in all God is doing in and through your life. We would love to continue with you on that journey. If you have any questions or prayer requests, visit lifechurchtoday.com or email us. We offer free counseling and a free Bible school because we train numerous people into ministry. Use your talents and answer God's call. God wants to do so much for you and through you. If you would like to give, click the donation button on the site. Pastor Robinson's 40 books are on Amazon.
Welcome to the Gospel Truth Show produced by Cross and Crown Radio. We want to make a lasting difference in your life and in our community. Our mission is to produce biblical, entertaining, and Christ-centered programs for God's people and folks all around the world. Post a comment or question and sit back and enjoy the show. GospelTruthShow.Podbeam.com As we say, bless you. <laughs> now, a look in your outline there. It's also in your um, bulletin as well as, let's see, if I got an extra one, I need a copy of the outline. So don't forget me one, please. Oh, thank you so much. Sir. Acts chapter 3. So we just saw what Peter had done in the Gospels. And now in Acts, this is after the resurrection of Jesus and his ascension, and after Pentecost. In verse 1, in Acts chapter 3, remember it's in, on our Facebook page as well as our website. It says this, Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. That's about 3 p.m. Now this is only five weeks after Peter had just denied the Lord face to face and cursed him. And it says, And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask arms for those who enter the temple. Now that particular gate was uh, made of Corinthian brass, and it was just absolutely beautiful, the most valuable uh, gate in that whole temple. And it was an area that would uh, keep Gentiles out. It was also the area where the Sadducees had most of their seminaries. Remember, there's different denominations in Judaism at that time. You had the Pharisees, and you had the Sadducees as the two biggest groups. Then you had the Essenes, and also uh, different other groups. But the Sadducees were the group, the denomination, if you will, that did not believe in miracles. So notice this. This guy who needs a miracle, doesn't really want a miracle, is not expecting one because he's sitting in an area where most of the crowd walking through doesn't believe in miracles. So that's where he's sitting at Solomon's uh, porch, as we'll see in just a minute. Who seen Peter and John about to go in the temple and ask for arms. So Peter and John are going to this daily uh, uh, prayer time. It's where they did the afternoon sacrifice. And fixing his eyes on him with John and Peter, Peter said, look at us. So he gave them attention, expecting to receive something from them. So, you know, that's, that's his profession. But when you look at the Greek, it's, it's a continuous tense and passive. So he's there all the time. Somebody's bringing him all the time. This is how he gets his money. This is how his family probably makes a living. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he's leaping, stood, and walked, and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. Then they knew that it was he who sat there begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what happened. So here's Peter and John being used for a mighty miracle. See, this is a different Peter than the Peter we saw earlier who denied the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? In Acts chapter 3 and Acts chapter 4, Peter's going to get so bold that he gets arrested for sharing his faith. But notice here, when Peter fell, what happened to get him there? There's a couple things that happened. The resurrection of Jesus, the day of Pentecost, and one very important verse. Look at Mark chapter 16, 7 on your outline there. Mark chapter 16, verse 7. This is what the angel is going to tell Mary. Now, notice what the angel says to Mary. But go tell the disciples and Peter. Did you catch that? And Peter. That he's going, that Jesus is going before you in Galilee. So he says, go tell the disciples and Peter. Don't you just love that? Remember, Peter's looking the Lord face to face and denies him three times while cursing. Okay? Go tell Peter. See, it must have been the worst night of Peter's life. He failed. He failed Jesus miserably. It must have been the lowest part of Peter's life ever. It was a moonlit night because it was near the holiday of Passover. But it was a moment of weakness for Peter. This rough, bullish fisherman failed that night. When it mattered most, Peter failed Jesus. All of us know that place. There's a place where we discover, a place that we discover that we were weaker than we thought we were. We were weaker than we 
thought throughout our whole life that we were we were not ready for that moment. I, you know, I don't mean to pry in all your lives, but I know me. At some point, you discovered that you were weaker than you thought. You were following Jesus, and some length of time maybe, and there was a situation that you discovered a weakness. Maybe you got really mean. Maybe you got nasty. Maybe you flipped somebody off from the freeway. I don't know what else. Maybe it was much worse than that. Amen? Amen. I wasn't in the car with you. <laughs> I remember getting busted one time, though. Before I was saved, I'm, I'm riding my bike down the street, and some guy honks at me. I'm thinking, what is this guy honking at? And so I flipped him off, right? <laughs> then as he drives by, I noticed it was my uncle's car. <laughs> he was honking to say hi. <laughs> My mom was waiting in the kitchen table for me. <laughs> but if you're like me, there comes a time where some of your flaws are right, risen to the surface. A weakness was brought to the surface with Peter. That Peter had matured to a place and yet he thought that he was going to go all the way with Jesus. Everybody else will leave you, but not me, Lord. There came a place that night for Peter that he did not know that was inside himself. See, he loved Jesus, he went to church, but he failed. And sometimes you're in that situation where you shocked yourself, like Peter. How could I do that? I'm a Christian. I, I'm, I'm starting this thing with Jesus, and Jesus would never do that. How could I do that? But of course, Jesus is the only one who's not surprised. Somebody say amen. amen. Peter was surprised. Peter's shocked. But the Lord Jesus was not. I would dare to say that Peter blew it so bad that he was absolutely shocked to the bare of his bones. And it says that he went out and wept bitterly, bitterly. But Jesus was not surprised. The Lord is not surprised. As crazy as you've been, as messed up as some of us have been, as low as we have fallen, maybe with anger or greed, maybe we're cowards at some point, maybe we're just mean and nasty, whatever it was, some of you think you surprised Jesus, but you did not. Jesus told Peter he would deny him three times. And Peter said, no, no, I won't. Yeah, the rest of these guys, the rest of these fellows may, but not me. No, 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 I'm not going to do it. The rest of these guys, I ain't one of these kind of weak punks, these wimps. Jesus, you're everything to me. I'm all in for you. And Jesus said, Peter, let me tell you something. Before the rooster crows three times, you're going to deny me. Peter didn't know how weak he was. Peter was surprised and shocked. But Jesus knew the attitude that's deep inside us. Jesus knew. And yet Jesus still loved Peter. Go tell the disciples and Peter. But you and I, because we want to prove that we're better than the rest of them, I'm better than you. I'm more sanctified than you. I'm more holy than you. I'm more religious than you. There's something about us. We try to put others in a different class than ourselves. And then we end up surprising ourselves. I would never do this or that. You don't know what you might do. Something that you haven't had a chance to do, you cannot make a call on. It's a dangerous thing to play like that. Boy, well, I can't believe he, he did that. Can you imagine a Christian doing that? The text says, Peter denied Jesus face to face three times with cursing and cussing. He denied Jesus. Not you or me. Not his mother or father. He denied Jesus. And Jesus is Jesus. We don't know what we might have done because you weren't there. Next time you hear about a Christian who falls or fails, before you pass judgment, before you declare what you would have done, remember, you were not there. You did not see the drugs on the table. You were not the one who got the call at midnight. You weren't invited to the party. You don't know how you would have moved when the music started to play. You were not there when the DJ started. You weren't there. But that doesn't mean you and I aren't capable. Peter didn't know what was inside him. And the moment came and Peter failed. The man who was at the Mount of Transfiguration. Imagine that. The man who walked with Jesus for three years. Failed. The man who was called Stone. Failed. He crumbled under pressure. He was called by Jesus the rock. But he failed. <clears throat> He loved the Lord Jesus, 
but he failed. The same said to Jesus. Jesus said to him, you shall be called the rock. He failed. He was loving Jesus, but he failed. He believed the word, but he failed. He was faithful all the way up to there, but he failed. He failed publicly. And the preacher on the news is not the first person who failed. Peter did, 33 AD. The young gal, a little young gal, by the fire, said to Peter, you were a disciple of Jesus. Oh, no, 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 no. She came back. Oh, yeah, you're one of them. Oh, no, I, I'm not. I don't know. Don't bother me. And the text says others recognized him because they heard Peter speak. You're a Galilean. You're one of them. No, 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 I'm not. And then he cursed and cussed. And then the eyes of the Messiah, those eyes, struck Peter's eyes. Talk about a moment of despair. Peter didn't look or sound saved. Peter, he failed. Ain't nothing like failing Jesus. He failed publicly and repeatedly. When you do the same thing over and over, it ain't no slip. Can anybody relate to Peter? Yes. He did something over and over. <clears throat> couldn't understand. That God had to put up with me. See, we're all flawed. Look at Romans 3.23. Notice the text. The Greek tense is played out really well here. For all have sinned, notice that's present tense, and notice this, and fall short of the glory of God. It's not past tense, it's a continuous tense. We're all flawed, we're all weak at times, we all fail, we all need Jesus. If you don't need Jesus, there's something wrong with you, because you don't understand, you're blind. You need Jesus every single day. Amen. We mess up, we need the cross. <laughs> we need Jesus. Yes. See, God has already found you out. News alert. You're not perfect. But here's another news alert. If you believe in Jesus, you are pardoned. Absolutely pardoned in Jesus' name. All your sins, all your blunders, all your mistakes. Gone, gone, gone. Because of the cross of Jesus Christ. Oh, Somebody yeah. said, yes sir. Yes, Come on. Sir. Yes, sir. See, we've all been there. Peter failed. Peter failed. And he did not do it politely. His sin got ugly and nasty. His mouth got filthy. See, we all blow it. We all mess up. We need to see. Did my mouth actually say that? Sometimes we say, if it were not for the Lord, we all fall apart. Somebody shout praise Amen. the Lord. Praise the Lord. Lord. Peter fell profanely. He cursed and he cussed. Peter is an absolute mess. A man with a deep issue. Until, until one day, he stooped. They looked. Into the resurrection cave. Into the cave. And he saw that the Lord had risen. Peter was no longer artificially holy. Because he knew the Lord was risen. He was risen indeed. Glory, hallelujah. The Lord is risen. Yeah. Look at John near the bottom of your outline. John chapter 20. Starting with verse 2. John chapter 20. Well, I'll read some of the highlights there. John 20 verse 2. Then she ran and came to Peter, that's Mary, and said to them, They've taken away the Lord out of the tomb. And Peter therefore went out, and the other disciple, and they were going to the tomb. So they both ran together. And the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. And he, stooping down and looking in, then Peter came, followed him, and went into the tomb, and he saw and believed. Mm. Wow, don't you love that? He had to run. He had to run to Jesus. He had to run to his Savior. And today, no matter how much you sin against God's word, you run to Jesus. Amen. You run to Jesus. You run to Him every single day. See, Peter no longer cared about self-righteousness. It says he ran to the tomb and he stooped and he looked into the tomb, the empty tomb of Jesus. Peter looked and believed and that changed everything. Amen. Tell the person next to you, I believe. Go ahead. I believe. I believe. <laughs> See, we can learn three main things here. Number one, we need to run to Jesus Amen. all the time. If you think you have it all together, guess what you don't. Jesus is the only one that had it all together. So we need Jesus all the time. The more mature you get, the more you start moving and, and becoming more and more like Jesus, the more you realize how much you really, really need Him. So we all need Jesus, number one. Number two, stoop. So move in humility. Always esteem others better than yourselves because that's what the Lord wants you to do. Jesus moved in humility. Peter had to stoop. That's a sign of humility. And understand the resurrection that we serve. A risen, reigning Savior. 
Muhammad's in his grave. Buddha's in his grave. Moses is in his grave. We serve a risen, reigning Savior. Glory, hallelujah. Jesus is like someone shout hallelujah. The risen Jesus said to Mary, go tell the twelve and Peter. Call Peter by name. Don't just say disciples. Because if you say just disciples, Peter would think that he's not included. He disqualified himself. You say disciples and Peter. Amen. That's our Lord Jesus. Yes. That's our Lord. And five weeks later, not a year later, five weeks later, he was then preaching on Pentecost. Mm -hmm. After making oh, one of the biggest sins you possibly <laughs> could, he was then going and preaching to the lost. Mm -hmm. In Acts 3.22, it says that Moses truly said to the fathers, it's there on your outline, Acts 3.22, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me, Moses is speaking, from, a, uh, from your brethren. Him you shall hear in all things, whatever he says to you. Notice that. So Jesus, the Messiah, is going to be like Moses. You know, one of the main reasons, it's not the only reason that we have the Old Testament is, it points to Jesus. Every character, all the temple furniture, all the holidays, all those things were pointing to the coming of Jesus, including Moses. Moses, as an imperfect man... A lot of his life was parallel to Jesus because he's getting the Jewish people and all of us ready for the coming Messiah. The parallel between Moses and Jesus are this. Notice this. Moses, an evil king, Pharaoh, tried to kill him. King Herod tried to kill the baby Jesus. Moses was hidden from the evil king, so was Jesus. Moses went into Egypt to preserve his life, so did Jesus. Pharaoh's daughter adopted Moses. Joseph adopted Jesus. Moses became a prince of Egypt. Jesus is a prince of peace. Moses came to save the Hebrew kinsmen. Jesus said he first came to save his kinsmen, the Jewish people. <clears throat> Moses saved women at the well. Jesus saved a woman at the well. Moses became a shepherd. Jesus is the good shepherd. Moses' mission was to redeem Israel from slavery of Egypt. Jesus' mission is to redeem mankind from the slavery of sin. Amen. Moses was loved and supported in his ministry by his sister named Miriam, which is a name for Mary. Jesus was loved and supported in his ministry by his mother Mary, which is also the uh, word Miriam in Hebrew. He was often rejected by his own people. Jesus was rejected by his. Moses gave God's law. Jesus gave God's new law. Moses spent 40 days fasting. Jesus spent 40 days fasting. And it goes on and on. When you read the characters in the Old Testament, you say, oh, this is boring. Look where Jesus is standing out there. Because all those pages, Jesus said, speaks of him. Now, the old Peter was an emotional wreck. He's fallen miserably. But Jesus called him by name. And you know, there's something about hearing your name from Jesus. Something about him calling you by name. Oh, John, my son, come here. Jesus saying, oh, Betty, my dear one, come unto me. Or my daughter, my beloved daughter, Linda, come over here. I'll, I'll love you unconditionally. Oh, my flawed son, Tom, Tommy, come here and I'll give you rest. Sometimes I just need to hear my name called by Jesus. Hallelujah. Mike, Mike. Sometimes I need the Lord to say, Mike, come here. I saw you sin, but I kept you. I love you, and I forgive you. And Peter, Peter needed his name called by Jesus. And every now and then, the Lord Jesus calls you by name. When you mess up, Jesus comes gently and whispers in your heart, Kathy, my daughter, my darling, Sammy, my boy. Jim, I'll, I'll keep you. Joy, I'm the one who holds you up. Julie, my little Daisy, my beloved. You're always, always in my heart. Every now and then, indeed, I need Jesus to call my name. And Jesus says, I don't love you only when you do good, but I love you even when you fail. Tell the person next to you, that's true. That's really true. I won't put you out, Jesus says, when you mess up. Jesus is that kind of God. When Peter heard his name, that was mercy. 
When you hear your name, that's mercy. When you're allowed to live in joy and love and peace in your daily life, that's mercy. That's mercy. When you know you have a place in heaven because of the cross alone, that's mercy. When you have brothers and sisters that love you unconditionally, that's mercy. When you mess up and you look in the mirror and you say, you know what, I'm still accepted by Jesus, that's mercy. Somebody shout hallelujah. That's mercy. To use flawed scraps, mistake prone believers like you and I. Indeed, I'm here by mercy. I don't deserve to be here. None of us deserve to be here, but it's by God's mercy, His grace. Now, on the day of Pentecost, God didn't use a perfect person, He used Peter as a keynote speaker. Mm -hmm. Just five short weeks after His fall. And God has the audacity. To take you out of that middle class house, or the jail house, or the unrighteous house, or your beautiful mansion. And Jesus touches you right where you are. And he saves you, and forgives you, and redeems you. Even when you fail, he will always use you to love others. Because you know what? Someone who fails understands that other people need that mercy too. Somebody yeah. say amen. Yeah. We all mess up. We need each other. We need each other in the sense of love. That we look at each other with the love of Jesus. Not man-made love. Not love if you do good to me, but I love you in the name of Jesus. Yes. That's what people need. That's what out there need. That culture yes. needs real love. So I'm saying that. The quick stuff in Hollywood won't do. They need the love that flows from that cross. Yes. The love that gave it all for you and I. The love that comes from the heart of Jesus. Yes. We need Jesus every single moment of every single day. Yes. And notice, help me close here. Peter preached to the same people. Who knew he failed. That's mercy. That's grace. And for you, the pit of your sorrow is a launching pad for your victory. Someone shout praise the Lord. Amen. The place of your beatdown is now the place of your triumph. People may see you come up and down. But God is able. God is able. Thank God Almighty. God is able to do anything in life that He wants to do. Now receive that in Jesus' name. And shout Amen. glory. Shout glory. That's the Lord Jesus. We want to follow the master, the king. We're serving Jesus, the soon coming king. Somebody say, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Jesus is so wonderful, so marvelous. He loves us so deeply and unconditionally. Jesus says, beloved, I love you. And when I look at the worship today and the music's going, I know you love him. Amen. I know you love him. If an archangel came in here, he'd say, them people, they love Jesus. They love him. You love Him. And you have every reason to love Him. To love Jesus. You love Him because of what He did for you on the cross. You love Him because He touched your heart. You love Him because He forgave you and accepted you. You love Him because He's always, always with you. And that's our Lord Jesus Christ. Make this day and every day the Lord's day. Yes. That Jesus is with you. That you worship with all that you are. And you say, Lord, use me. Use me to move a little bit more like Jesus every day. As much as I've messed up, Lord, use me to touch other people who've messed up. They need that love. They need that love. Let's go to the Lord and pray. Thanks for joining us at Life Church today. It's our joy to play a role in all God is doing in and through your life. We would love to continue with you on that journey. If you have any questions or prayer requests, visit lifechurchtoday.com or email us. We offer free counseling and a free Bible school because we train numerous people into ministry. Use your talents and answer God's call. God wants to do so much for you and through you. If you would like to give, click the donation button on the site. Pastor Robinson's 40 books are on Amazon. Yeah, this is Cross and Ground Radio. And I'm Mike Robinson, your host. We got a interesting show because we're going to go through the dreadful day of the Lord. What should we be doing right now as Christians? And if you're not a Christian, what should you be doing? With all the things going on in the world, across America, across the streets in all of our states, throughout parts of the world, certain things are getting absolutely crazy and bonkers. So what do we need? We need the sure application of God's covenant of truth and love through Jesus Christ, through the gospel. That's what we need. We really, really need Jesus. And so go to Malachi chapter 4. 
last book in the Old Testament before we get to the New Testament, which is really interesting. I'm going to see with the day coming, what should we be doing? How should we prepare? Uh, what about this prophecy teacher? What about that prophecy teacher? What about my family? What about my myself? How do I protect myself? What about all this COVID stuff? What about all the conspiracy theories? What about all the mayhem? Why does why do the leftists hate us so much? Is there any way to turn that around? And so we're going to get into that right now. And so Malachi chapter 4, verse 1 says this, For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven. And all the proud, yes, all those who do wicked, will stubble. So you don't have to worry. That's God's promise. You turn on the TV and you watch those people attack the Christian worldview. You see them assault everything that's lovely and beautiful and pure. And you want to go back at them with rage. No, go back to them with prayer, with truth. And sometimes the truth has to be given with uh, some severity, some increased passion, and some zeal. But a lot of times, if not most of the time, peaceful, graceful, merciful, and extend what true peace is, which is shalom. Shalom is peace, which means wholeness, wellness, absence of war. These things we want in our lives, redemption, salvation, those are all aspects of shalom. So we say shalom to you today, shalom to me, shalom to the world in Jesus' name. This is what we see more and more that we need in our households, my household, your, the churches, the states, and throughout the world. And all the proud, yes, all, notice that, all, who do wickedly will stumble. And the day which is coming shall burn them up. So says the Lord of hosts, that you will leave neither root nor branch. It's all gone. All the wickedness, all the evil, all the darkness, all the sin, all the transgressions, all the murder, all the mayhem. You don't have to worry about it. God is God and he is good and he's going to take care of business. And part of that is us. Us not becoming violent. Yes, there's a place for guns, definitely in the Christian worldview. There's a place for self-protection, definitely. But also there's a huge place for love. And part of love is speaking the truth. And we need to do that, even if they don't want to hear it. But we must be those who constantly move in love and mercy and patience and peace and truly, truly love others. Father, help us today love others. Lord, we really, really need to love others in Jesus' name. Lord, we want to be more and more like our Savior, like Jesus, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus, our Savior and Lord. But to you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall rise with healing in his wings. Oh boy, do I need that in Jesus' name. Boy, do we need all that in Jesus' name. Lord, if that's your will, make it happen even right now. Why? Before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Wow. That's what it says. That's what it says in the Bible. And then when you go to the book of Acts and you see the disciples concerned about such type of passages, you go to Acts chapter 1 and you see what's happening there in verse 3. Acts chapter 1, verse 3. We need to be a spirit-filled people. Word and spirit, covenant and grace. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one true living God as the only true God in our lives. No idols. And so he says this in the book of Acts, Luke's writes, by the power of the Holy Spirit, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering many infallible proofs. See, Christianity is not maybe true. It's not just possibly true. It's not probably true. It has to be true. Christianity is certain. Without the Christian worldview, one cannot account for anything, including predication, including reason, including logic, including moral law, including ongoing personhood. And we could just have more and more, including mathematics, geometry, all these things that touch on and have aspects of universal immutables, only God, but universal reach and is immutable can account for these things 
because our physical world lacks these attributes. So he allowed himself, presented himself alive after suffering many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. We're kingdom people. It's about the kingdom. We need to move in the kingdom, love the kingdom, embrace the kingdom. Why? Because Jesus is the king. I'm not the king. Your pastor's not the king. Your elders are not the king. Your denomination's not the king. Most of those things, I'm sure, are really, really good, and they're, they're walking in godly ways, and we delight and rejoice in their work and their ministry. But it's about Jesus. He's wonderful. He builds his church, and he uses his people. He uses his elders and deacons. And that's wonderful news, but still, ultimately, it's all about Jesus. And then verse 9, Then when he had spoken these things, while they watched, Jesus was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadily, steadfastly toward heaven, this cloud, of course, is another term for glory. So there's the glory of God right there, right in front of them, the Shekinah glory bursting all around them. What a sh Can you imagine seeing that? And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as Jesus went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus was taken up from you into heaven and will come back in manner as you saw him go into heaven. So what's going to happen? Jesus is going to come back. It could be in the next minute. It could be in the next 10 years. I know there's some really um, devout people who have a, a, a particular theology and eschatology that you think it's really, really precise, and perhaps you're right. And go ahead and send us some of those. We like viewing them. But we all know for sure that Jesus is coming again. And so while we're waiting for him to come again, we need to preach the gospel. We need to do that, not just talk about it, not just sit in our churches, but preach the gospel to those in the marketplace, those on social media, those around the world. And then we need to pray for people, help them, love them. We need to hold them and care for people. People really, really need Jesus, and we're here to represent him and to be those who move and, and uh, share his love in their lives. To really, really see Jesus come and love us and love our families and change our families and change our churches. Boy, do we need revival. We need reformation and revival. But God can do that. God is obviously up to the task. And so for me personally, I want to follow hard after Jesus every single day that I live. And my prayer is that you will also. And if you don't know Jesus or you've walked away from him for a while, or say you were raised an atheist, agnostic, a Hindu, a Muslim, whatever, throw that away. Put all that aside. Turn from it. Repent from it. And come to Christ. <clears throat> and simply say to the Lord, Lord, you're my God and you're my Savior. I believe you died on the cross for all my sins. I believe you were buried and God raised you from the dead. I give you my whole heart and my whole life. Amen and amen. Stay tuned for the next part of the show. And we'll try to keep these going. And we're so blessed that you've joined us today. Until next time.